May the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds. Amen. We have gathered here together to offer gratitude to God for the life of Nancy Reedy Miller. She was a beloved daughter, sister, wife and partner to Don for many, many years. She was a treasured mother and grandmother, friend and faithful servant in Christ. We give thanks for the many ways that she touched people with her care and hospitality, the warmth of her smile, and the unique way that she reflected the light of Christ to those around her. Today we place ourselves in God's presence and care as we commend Nancy into God's eternal being and love. May these words from Psalm 8 remind us of the beauty of creation that Nancy so loved and the loving relationship that she had with creation and continues to have with her creator. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please join with me in prayer. Holy and loving God, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. You are our guardian in life and in death. By you we were brought into being, and in your care and keeping we leave this life. Through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, you offer us eternal life. We deeply thank you, God, for Nancy. She lived her life in faith, discipleship, and love, and she now finds rest in you. We ask your abiding comfort for Nancy's family in this hour and in the days, weeks, and months to come. Fill each of them and all of us who grieve with your peace and assurance. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I invite you to turn to number 203 in the Purple Voices Together hymnal, and Rebecca will lead us in singing.
I know all of us here today have memories of Nancy that have deeply touched our lives. I hope my thoughts today reflect what many of you knew about Nancy and remind us to treasure and honor those memories. Bear with me, I'm gonna get my act together again. My first memories of Nancy were when I was one week short of six years old. Our family lived in Kansas and we had traveled to Flanagan, Illinois to attend the wedding of my dad's youngest brother, Don, to Nancy Reedy. It was my first memory of a gathering with the extended Miller family and a rare opportunity for us as we lived distant from family who then lived in Idaho and those living back east, which was how we referred to Indiana and Ohio. She was radiant. I thought she was lovely. She had a smile that never left. I doubt I said a word to her. Just, I was just the young girl observing all the celebration. Several years later, we were able to attend a Miller gathering at Don and Lita Snyder's in Arlington Heights, and I rem remember watching Don and Nancy arrive in some kind of sports car. Boy, I thought they were cool. In 1967, my parents made the decision to move our family from Wichita, Kansas to Elkhart so that Dad could attend what was then Mennonite Biblical Seminaries. How those arrangements were made, I have no idea, but we arrived and were welcomed by Nancy and Donnie, all six of us. Where they put the things that came in our U-Haul, I don't remember. The plan was that we would arrive in Elkhart and then we'd find a place to rent. It's not like it is now. How it happened back then, I don't know what they thought it would be, but my dad finally started going door to door, inquiring if anyone knew of a place to rent. Nancy wrote to we girls when my mom died, he pounded the pavement. As my sisters and I recall, we lived with them for at least a month. Karen and Lane were little girls, but can you imagine that, that they welcomed us for that length of time? But for me, all those memories are just of, of those adorable cousins and lots of fun. What generous hospitality. Doug arrived during the next two years that we lived there, and I was privileged to be able to babysit many times with Karen and Elaine and Doug. The extended Miller family was very intentional about gathering. The votes, the Snyders, the Wises, and Don and Nancy opened their homes, and we would all pile in over the next 50 plus years. Lots of food, games, stories, creative crazy skits, and singing, oh the singing. And when we cousins started getting married, there were more opportunities together. The crowd just kept growing. There were also summer trips to Idaho and the Tetons, and at times different church camps. It was in those settings I observed what I considered one of Nancy's spiritual gifts. She was so intentional about meeting, greeting, including, inviting participation, and having intentional conversation with people that went so far beyond just welcoming. She sought out new or first time attendees, teenagers going through those awkward years, and young adults finding their way through life. She made sure you felt you belonged. It was so much more than hospitality. Several years ago, Don and Nancy started coming to Tucson, Arizona during the winter months. We had a home there, and it was a highlight when they came. We hiked together, we hosted them for dinners, we tried new Thai restaurants, and just hung out. It always seemed that Nancy picked up right where we had left off. Conversation with her was intentional. She was engaged. I knew she was listening and asking inquisitive questions. We didn't have enough of those years. Last September, Doug and I were in northern Indiana and we asked if we could take her out to dinner. When, dinner, when we arrived, dinner was ready and the table was set on the patio. I think a conversation with Karen had influenced that decision. But she said we could talk easier if we just ate there. It was a lovely evening. We had just decided to move permanently to Tucson. She inquired and we candidly discussed transitions, the move for us and the loss of a spouse for her. We did a lot of reminiscing about times together. And as we went to leave, she said, tonight was such a good time of remembering. 
I'm thinking maybe I should reconsider spending time in Tucson. We promised we would hold her to continuing that discussion. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that I also admire the way she managed that teasing, honorary spouse of hers. Oh, the stories I know we all could tell. Donnie loved my husband Doug's coffee. Doug explained his approach, which was freshly roasted beans, normally once or twice a week, good water, and a certain brand of a coffee machine. Donnie thought, sure, Doug needed to upgrade, and then he was going to be willing to take the prior machine off Doug's hands. This went on for several years, and finally one time I said to him, I think you can afford to buy one for yourself and get on with it. Nancy piped up quickly with that smirk on her face and said, you think? In April of this year, as I was driving a 16-foot truck with the last of our things from Illinois, Doug was behind me in our truck pulling a trailer. We were way out in western Texas, and I decided to call and check in. She was returning from a visit with Doug, Lolly, Lucy, and Annie, was feeling a bit sleepy, and was thinking about pulling over for a short nap. We kept each other awake for the next 45 minutes. I treasure that last conversation. She was never afraid to speak about difficult things, whether they were her own or the person she was talking to. She was an engaged listener. It was obvious how much she cared about the people in her life. We ended that conversation with a hope that we would see her back in Tucson this winter. In 2018, we attended a Miller gathering in the Tetons. Our son Matt and two of his children joined us there. Preston was 11 and Brooklyn was 13. And they were at an event with, I don't know, 40 to 50 of us at least, and they knew no one except us. Nancy told me she had mentioned to Levi that Preston would need a friend to feel included. I don't think Sean and Karen had even finished setting up their RV and unloading when there was a knock on our door. Levi had come over to introduce himself to Preston and invite him to hang out and play ball. Annie, you did the same with Brooklyn. It was a week they thoroughly enjoyed, they felt totally included, and they remember it fondly. Once again, Nancy was just being Nancy, modeling and encouraging others to practice hospitality, welcoming and including. Many persons who responded to Karen Elaine and Doug's personal Facebook posts noticed how welcoming she was. For me, that is such an important part of her legacy. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. May we all celebrate Nancy's life lived in that way. And we, may we pass on those blessings that we receive from her, knowing her to others that we are in contact with. Several months ago, Nancy shared this book with me, with Sam and me. The Underwater Explorers, who made my Octopus Teacher documentary, created this book full of stunning photos. It's just an amazing, wonderful photo book. When I commented about all these, her response was that she appreciated the narrative even more than the photos. So, Nancy did not just skim or scan books, she read them. Why did I ever wonder? Well, she was a voracious reader and checked out satchels full from the library from the extensive reading list she kept. No willy-nilly selections for her. Ever curious, however, she freely did borrow and browse and check out books like this that caught her attention. 
More recently, I noticed a stamped and addressed envelope on her counter and remarked about her being one who sends USPS postal cards and, and greetings. Yes, she likes to get cards and figures that others do too. No email for her. I didn't know the banjo picking Nancy or the quiz team coach, the hiking, camping Nancy or the sister, mother, grandmother. We learned to know each other in Goshen after she and Don settled here in retirement. Stan knew Don and Nancy from college days. For a number of years, they and we traveled a lot to our several destinations to visit our children and grandchildren, extending our, our journeys in the doing. We learned to know each other better at, during the times that our calendars synced. Over time, I learned to know that as she would have done in piano and banjo, Nancy lived in tune and in harmony with the world and herself. Recently on a day in August, unlike the two of us, she and I did a one of an only kind of thing together. She was planning to go to a tree farm north of Middlebury to select a couple of trees. I'd heard good things about this place and she agreed to have me go along with her. Since neither of us had ever been to Kreider Garden, we planned to include a stop there, too. The day was idyllic. The trees all appealed. And her selection of native trees, a bald cypress and beech tree, came with decisive pleasure. Following our stroll in the Kreider Garden, we discovered the lunch hour was nearly past. Where to go? She'd never been to Village Inn on Main Street and was aware that her sister-in-law and husband liked to stop there for a favorite menu item when they had come to the area. A good reason to try it. I knew I liked pies. As we received our bean soup, Nancy noted the large piece of cornbread. We soon were saying hi to another Goshen person who, knew, who we knew who had come in for a piece of pie. Hi, how are you doing, she said. I've not seen you around recently. Maybe you're still not going out a lot since COVID. Nancy's genuine interest, the warmth and care of her full attention led to a personal conversation, one that I'll long value and carry with me. As she returned to her soup, I'd finished mine, she decided she had enough and was ready for pie. When it came for the time for the check, Nancy began to wrap her remaining cord bread in a napkin. When the waiter, an Amish woman, likely a grandmother like ourselves, asked if she would like to take the soup too, the question was, well, how would I take it? Oh, we have carry-out boxes. And what are they made of? Well, you know, the usual. You mean styrofoam? Yes. No, thank you, then. I'll just leave the soup here. No, no, I'll get you a box. Yes, but that, what would I do with it when I'm finished? Throw it in the trash. That's just it. In the trash, in the landfill, it will not decompose. It will stay there forever, and I can't do that. So, no thank you. Like styrofoam, this memory, a treasure, will be long-lasting. Shortly after Nancy's death, this two-line Diane Ackerman quote arrived in my inbox. It has Nancy's name written all over it, and I share it with you. I don't want to get to the end of my life and find that I have lived just the length of it. I want to have lived the width of it as well. Nancy lived the width of her life. Yes, she did. And I'm grateful for the memories.
In On Grief Observed, C.S. Lewis wrote that it isn't just that the loved one died. It's that the part of him that only the loved one could bring out would never be brought out again. Perhaps the best way to preserve this piece of meat that will be otherwise lost will be to talk about mom and our relationship. She was born in Graymont, Illinois, a small town where everyone knew her and she knew everyone. She and her older sister Joanne and younger brother Stan played all over town, though they had their chores. Mom recalled how they liked to put pins on the railroad track that bordered the edge of their backyard, running to gather the flattened pins after the train passed. Mom picked up her love of reading there from her mother, Velda, and never let that love fade from her life. She was the popular homecoming queen at her high school in Pontiac and rode in a convertible in the parade, which gave her celebrity status in my childhood mind. Attending Goshen College was the first stage of her life away from Graymont. She met Don Miller in her first year and wrote letters to him in that summer, which were signed, The Hick from the Sticks. Her mother died rather suddenly of a brain tumor in her sophomore year, and she married dad later that year. They moved to Boys Village in Ohio for dad to do 1W service, then to Cleveland for his master's degree, and then on to Wadsworth. She decided to try for a degree in nursing at that point. She recalled sitting outside a class in her car, listening to the radio, when she heard the news about President Kennedy's assassination, which somehow led to a realization that nursing wasn't for her. They started a family with me and moved from Ohio to Elkhart, Indiana. Elaine and Doug came soon after. The three of us had freedom to roam our big backyard, climb the pear tree. Doug was too young for climbing the pear tree, I think. And peeking down on mom as she weeded in our garden. I remember her cooking, playing the old upright piano, and singing songs in our bedroom with dad playing on the guitar at bedtime. When we moved to Springfield, Ohio for dad's new job, she worried that they would never be able to pay the mortgage, which was the princely and terrifying sum of $13,000. Every year, she bought flats of flowers and seeds for the garden, which we helped plant. She sewed our Barbie dresses and our clothes, ironed sheets, and took us to the library, never politicking our choices. She expected us to learn the work needed to keep up a house, and I'm proud to report that my Aunt Lita once praised my cleaning skills as we worked to prep my cousin Donna's house for sale. We needed to learn to cook as well when she decided to go back to college to finish and get a degree in teaching special education. She drove a white, battered VW Bug that didn't have air conditioning or heat. She had to keep a wool blanket in the car to cover her legs to keep from shivering as she drove almost an hour to and from class. I went to her graduation at Wright State University with the worst sunburn of my life and couldn't even recline against the seat back of the chair. This did somewhat affect my memory of the actual event. (laughs) They moved to Portsmouth, Ohio next, where she got a job at Wheelersburg High School. She convinced the school that they needed a program for talented and gifted kids, and they put her in charge of it. She often said that there really wasn't much difference between the kids in the special ed classroom and that in the talented and gifted one. Their last move for work reasons was to Saginaw, Michigan. There she decided to get her master's degree in education from Michigan State, where she again had to drive an hour for classes. A few years later, my job prospects withered and dad invited me to live with them for a while. Three days later, I was volunteering in the high school where she taught, and someone ran into the library and essentially offered me a teaching job on the spot. I ended up living with them for several years while I took classes at the local community college and prepped for med school. We took vacations together out west during those years, forging memories with the three of us. Mom and I cooked together, took walks together, taught, studied, went to church, church at 9th Street Mennonite, planted, weeded, 
read, cleaned, and watched ER and Masterpiece Theater together. I once counted the periodicals which came to the Saginaw House. There were 22 daily, weekly, and monthly newspapers and magazines. That didn't stop us from going to the library, of course. In Saginaw, I once caught her reading from the end of a book, and I learned that it was a lifelong habit to cheat and read the end if she wanted to know whether things would work out. I was appalled. I also learned that she was among the first subscribers to Ms. Magazine when we found issue one, worth nearly $500 today, with its iconic picture of Wonder Woman completely ruined in a basement flood. She also had a soft spot for memoirs, especially women who grew up in circumstances very different from her own. In later years, she began to expand her reading interests into the field of anti-racism. She started with white fragility and was partway through me and white supremacy when she died, taking notes in the book as she was determined to learn whether she was still harboring any trace of racism. She was open to the possibility that she was. When I returned three bags of books to the library after she was hospitalized, I found five with bookmarks, emphasizing that she liked to read multiple books at one time. After retirement and their final move to Goshen, mom and dad bought a fifth wheel camper. On the maiden trip to Alaska, they had many adventures, including meeting a woman born at, at Goshen Hospital at the Otter Bay Fish Docks, who gave them a large bag of halibut after a good talk. They picked up hitchhikers who paid for the favor by sharing their life stories. And mom noted in the Alaska Journal that their travel was enhanced by conversations they had in gift shops, campgrounds, and every highway and byway. Mom's biggest adventure there was on the Chilkoot Trail backpack trip. On the day that they were climbing Chilkoot Pass, a storm rolled in. Covered in snow and underdressed, they staggered into the ranger's home at Sheep Camp. The resourceful woman tucked mom, clothes and all, directly into her own bed to warm her up. On a different backpack trip into the Grand Canyon, a flash flood required everyone's evacuation. They squeezed onto the last helicopter ride out. Other trips to the Southwest involved multiple biking and hiking adventures, running out of water, food, and spare tires for their bike. Both of them kept travel journals, which are entertaining reading, as they often reported their meal selections as much as the scenery. She used her big house in Goshen to host family and friends from across the US and Canada, but even when no one was there, she used the whole of her house, the width of it, as Bonnie might say. She ate in the kitchen, kept track of the books she had finished on the dining room table, sorted pictures in the office, played her way through the new hymnal in the living room, watched PBS NewsHour downstairs while ironing, planned projects in the sewing room, and journaled almost every weekend at the upstairs hallway desk. But the yard with its extensive flower beds crammed with annuals and perennials, highlighting the Indiana native species, as well as the garden bursting with fruit and vegetables were her special creation. Mom was a frequent visitor to our home. She enjoyed visiting Boise at Halloween and once spent many hours wrestling a diaphanous fabric through the sewing machine for Levi to have a layered, realistic ghost costume. All of our nannies loved mom and dad's visits since they didn't sit around criticizing but pitched in to get the neglected tasks done. She taught more than one of them how to cook. One of Angela's favorite activities with mom was making her delicious granola. She came to help for a month after Levi was born in Albuquerque where she gave me what was probably one of the only pieces of unsolicited advice about parenting. I remember her turning away from the sink looking toward me and saying she had one regret about raising us. It was that she knew buying organic was better for us, but she didn't do it often, 
and wanted me to be diligent about buying organic and keeping Levi free from harmful chemicals. Of all the things to regret, Mom was a member of the Springfield Co-op, and I date her interest in buying organic to the free-range hippies who shopped and hung out there. It was someone there who urged her to try wheat germ, which led to a shameful era that culminated in the nadir of recipes ever found in a Mennonite cookbook, which was labeled a cookie called wheat germ balls. I will simply say that Elaine's notation in the cookbook after sampling said item reads grossest thing alive, <laughs> which is nothing more than brutal fact. Wheat germ's role subsided into granola alone after that debacle. Mom's interest in cooking international foods took off after Don and Joyce Wise returned from Vietnam. She signed up for the MCC paper pla uh, placemats that had Midwesterners learning recipes from different countries, like tacos. She gamely tried them all, even when we were a little reluctant. An early and enthusiastic adopter of Extending the Table, the Mennonite cookbook featuring recipes and food vignettes from around the world, she soon found her favorites and made many pithy observations about them right on the pages. My favorite was her bright, colorful stir fries with meat for flavor. Her way of saying that half a pound of chicken would be stretched to feed five. It's something that didn't work in my own family. She experimented with baking gluten-free items for Seth and Isaac's benefit. Her latest kick was making the sheet pan specials highlighted in the New York Times cooking section and critiquing them for taste and ease. I only wish the renowned chef of one such recipe had heard her kindly say that it looked a lot better than it tasted. Mom was a truly kind person who tried to help my boys channel their inner kind. Her special needs students would always see her rooting them on when they went to graduation, and more than one student kept in touch decades later. Service and delivery people had long relationships with her, and quite a few of them expressed genuine sorrow and shared anecdotes about her after she was hospitalized and died. She was generous with her time, money, and love. I rarely heard a cross word from her. She created birthday cards from photographs, wrote thank you cards, made and delivered meals to people, served on church committees, and consistently tried to learn how to be a better person. We talked on the phone almost every day as I drove the boys to school, so we shared many of the small doings of our days. She recently shared her thoughts after a small group conversation on the book White Fragility. A number of people, she said, reported they were going to try to be anti-racist. She told me, People were saying they were going to try to be anti-racist. Just do it. This urge to do, I feel, sums up her life in a nutshell. It was a long, a loving and beloved life full of doing. I'm going to be reading Let Evening Come by Jane Kenyon. Let the light of late afternoon shine through chinks in the barn, moving up the bales as the sun moves down. Let the cricket take up chafing as a woman takes up her needles and her yarn. Let evening come. Let dew collect on the hoe abandoned in long grass. Let the stars appear and the moon disclose her sil silver horn. Let the fox go back to its sandy den. Let the wind die down. Let the shed go black inside. Let evening come. To the bottle in the ditch, to the scoop in the oats, to the air in the lung, let evening come. Let it come as it will, and don't be afraid. God does not leave us comfortless, so let evening come.
My Life Flows On in Endless Song, number 605 in Voices Together. And if you would like to stand as you sing, feel free. Nothing is lost on the breath of God, number 653.
All right. I will be reading um, Micah 6, 8, and Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Okay. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Okay, Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. The guidance of Micah 6, 8 aptly describes how Nancy sought to live her life and how she did live her life. Her life was shaped by faith, seeking justice, embracing beauty, and serving God and others in all kinds of capacities. I experienced her as very down to earth, but I will still venture to say that she lived out these callings in remarkable ways. It's not every day that I have the privilege to celebrate the life of a woman who came to Goshen College with one suitcase and one box of odds and ends, who later became a dedicated educator who coached their school's local quiz bowl team, not only did the county title, but the state title and then the national title in science and math. And just to be sure, I think both things are remarkable. The national title as well as coming to Goshen College with one suitcase and one box of odds and ends. Just a small example of what is remarkable about Nancy. God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. It's sometimes hard to find words to capture and summarize a person's rich life and, and capture the depth of experiences. We've heard a lot of that today already, but this verse seems to capture Nancy's spirit and her sense of direction so well. Nancy was steeped in the life of the church throughout her years in Illinois, to Indiana, to Ohio, to Michigan, to backpack trails out west in an Alaskan adventure, in all these places, loving God, seeking God, and serving God were constants. And Nancy did this with humility, kindness, and rich hospitality that was punctuated by her warm, and welcoming and never-ending smile. She did this loving, seeking, and serving, always with a bent and a care for justice. Right away, early in their marriage, she accompanied Don as he went to serve at, a, at Boys Village, a safe haven for traumatized youth in Ohio. Later, in another Ohio community, Don had taken a position at a social service agency, and Nancy began working with brain-injured children, and it was this experience that helped to inspire her to return to school to seek a degree in special education and learning disabilities. 
The very things that she involved herself in, her life's work and all the ways that she volunteered were centered in this prophetic guidance and the heart of Christ's gospel message to love God with one's, all of one's heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. She worked with children and youth, the small among us, those with both learning disabilities and those with high abilities. And in one school system, Nancy, along with another teacher, became sponsor of a multicultural club at the high school. And this group worked to address tensions and issues of racism. In this vein of seeking more and digging deep, into issues of injustice. This continued well beyond her teaching career. As her family noted in her obituary and as has been shared today, she had a strong interest in continuing to learn and understand social justice and structural inequalities. Here at College Mennonite, she became a dedicated member of the Jail Sisters a group of women that regularly visited incarcerated women to offer encouragement and spiritual support through worship services in the jail. Nancy fed people through delicious foods, not only hosting people in her home and offering food in times of celebration, but in times when people were deeply vulnerable while recovering from illness or surgery or treatments. She also helped to lovingly feed sleep-deprived parents of new infants as a part of our church's care. These are just some of the things that she did here as a part of our church family. You can see from what I have already shared why Nancy's family was also drawn to Matthew 25 as a text that focuses on the care for the least of these. Nancy lived in this way. It was, it was her mode, it was her ethic. It was her way of not only seeing Christ in others, but welcoming others as if they were Christ before her in the flesh. If we look at the context of the scripture text in Matthew, it, it is an apocalyptic text about final judgment. And this is not typically a theme that I would hone in on for a celebration of life service, memorial service, but some of the messages woven and embedded within it certainly are. There's a complexity in this text as it wrestles with how the world receives Christ or does not or how disciples receive Christ or do not, how we receive Christ or do not. The main thrust of this story is that when people respond to human need or fail to respond, they are in fact responding or failing to respond to Christ. When we really stop and contemplate this, this is tough. This, it's rubber meets the road kind of, kind of stuff, especially if those in need that we're being called to care for are strangers or those very different from us or even some who may scare us. But I don't think Nancy would have shied away from the hard parts of Jesus' words here, nor should we shy away. Nancy was willing to wrestle with tough issues and tough texts. This passage asks us, have we welcomed with radical love? When life happens or powers oppress, have we stood alongside in love and solidarity and active care for the needy? Nancy asked these questions of herself 
And I think she asked them of her community and of this world, and she kept doing so. She kept challenging herself, and I think she could do so because of the, the guidance and the vision woven into this text. Some would say that we misunderstand this text when we consider it apart from its apocalyptic final judgment thrust. But I would suggest we can see many layers of meaning and how this living word speaks to us today. Many a Christian, many a Mennonite, take inspiration from this text to help shape our ethics and how we are to serve those who are the least among us. When we do this, we are going beyond the immediate story, but not beyond the biblical story. It is in harmony with other themes in Matthew that focus heavily upon love of neighbor and who our neighbor is. The parable of Good Samaritan, for example. So if we consider many chords within the biblical story, we can receive this scripture not from a place of fearing judgment and just making sure that we behave ourselves by serving the least of these, but rather understanding the text as a reinforcement and inspiration and of the guiding words of Micah, of the guiding words of the greatest commandments to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. On all these things hang the law and the prophets. I believe that Nancy had a strong grounding of both how she was respond how she was to respond to life and to others, justly, humbly, with kindness and loving. And she also had a strong grounding in who to respond to and understanding who is our neighbor. Often, that is the person most on the margins, most in need. These ones that Jesus often referred to as the least of these or the poor. They are to be the benefactors of abundant, mercy-filled love, as if we were giving such love to Christ himself. To be sure, this caring for the least is not about earning one's way to glory in heaven, but it's the fruit and direction that comes with loving God with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving one's neighbor as oneself. Also, this idea of serving the least of these is not one of hierarchy. We all likely at one time or another have been one of the least of these. We have been in need. And what a tremendous gift when another has given us a cup of cold water, a warm coat, a listening ear, a loving embrace, or more. And in doing so, oh, we meet Christ in those spaces. I am so grateful that Nancy found a home there in those spaces. She found her grounding and her home and how to meet Christ. She had this from a very young age and it most certainly helped her to navigate how to live and serve. It also helped her to weather and navigate some great losses in her life, losing her mother when she was a college student and later Don's journey with cancer and saying goodbye to him. It's my hope and prayer that your faith and reflecting on Nancy's faith will comfort and guide you as you grieve and have had to say goodbye to this dear one. 
in closing, this dear faith that guided Nancy in life, including those difficult times of grief, including joyous times, this faith is the same faith that guided Nancy's humanitarian ethic, her caring, her serving. It's the same faith that guides us in our ethics and our caring and serving. It's a faith that binds us together. Even more, it is a faith that reminds us that love never ends, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so we grieve for Nancy, this dear loved one, but we do not grieve without hope. Amen. Number 661, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand. And again, I invite you to stand if you desire.
You may be seated. Following the benediction, the dismissal of the family and the postlude, you are invited to join in a meal in our fellowship hall to gather around tables and share stories and memories and enjoy good food, all things that, that Nancy would have appreciated and um, made alive in many of our lives. Hear now these words of benediction. May the God of glory and beauty, the word of life and the spirit of truth keep you and comfort you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>